Christ's name. All righty, I'm going to read in uh, first Cor- uh, Second Corinthians chapter um, 11, Second Corinthians and chapter 11, and uh, so I want to praise the Lord. That's all today. I just wanted to give God glory. I could never have made it. One of the things I wish I could have had time to talk about this morning is just with all the attacks and all the trials, I would never have made it. I don't even know how we made it. Uh, and all the things we've done, I don't know how we did them. It's just God and uh, His faithfulness and His goodness. And when we get to 25 years, we just say, what an amazing God. Amen. And uh, I want to praise the Lord for that. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Tonight's message is on dealing with pressure. If you think that I designed this message for you because we talked about it this week, understand you're about one of about nine people um, this week that we talked to me about pressure. And, uh, and so just understand that. Um, this is something I just kept telling people. Yeah, Sunday night I'll talk about that. And, uh, and in 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 11, it'll talk about Paul being under pressure. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I I am more. Um, in labors, uh, more abundant. In stripes, uh, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, saved one. Um, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day, uh, I, uh, I have been in the deep, a day and a, day and a half, in the, in the ocean. Uh, in a shipwreck, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, uh, in cold and nakedness. So those are just outward things that have happened to him, how many things he's been through all the time in danger, uh, troubles, beatings, uh, all kinds of stuff. But it goes beyond that. Um, verse uh, 28, to beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me uh, daily, the care of all the churches. He says, hey, inside, I've got all these churches that I've got to keep straight, that I've got to make sure they have a pastor, that we, we have a, in good doctrine. I've got all that care on the inside at the same time. And, uh, and so he just says, verse 29, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? Um, I mean, who is, who is going through it? Look, I mean, it's one of the fun things about leadership is when you're the leader, um, somebody else is offended and they say, oh, you poor thing. When leaders are offended, they say, what's wrong with you? And uh, that's, that's, what, uh, uh, that, that's what he says. And I, I go through it too. I have emotions. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, he says in verse uh, 30, uh, verse 30, if I might in his glory, I will glory in those things which concern mine infirmities, my trials and troubles and weaknesses, I glory in those things. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed for, forever more, knoweth that I lie not. Um, and uh, in Damascus, the governor under Aetarius, uh, uh, the king, uh, kept the city of, uh, of the... Uh, I'm sorry, with, uh, let me start the verse again there. In Damascus, the governor under the, uh, under Aretas, the king, kept the city of the uh, Damascenes uh, with the garrison desirous to apprehend me. And uh, through the window, um, in a basket, I was let down in the wall and escaped his hands. What a, what a testimony. What a, what a life that he went through. What pressures were on Paul. Let's pray. We'll talk about that. Father, thank you for the, the word of God. It's wonderful. Lord, I just think of everything we we go through the scripture is able to help us with and we are in a high pressure society high pressure world lord and we are attacked and uh, we have the world we just have life and pressures and finances and health and everything else lord i pray tonight that we learn to deal with pressure and that you would give us wisdom lord i know good people in here just like the apostle paul who was a good man just had a lot of weight on him a lot of uh, pressure coming from every direction, external and internal. And Lord, we have that. And I pray you'd help us tonight. I, we've had a good night. We've, we've given you glory and sung your praises and, uh, and been blessed. But I pray tonight, as we get into the word, as so many testified, it's the, it's the key to open doors, your word and, 
And uh, we pray tonight that you would speak to us again. You do it so often, and we give you the praise that you uh, just speak to us and uh, give us the word. And we pray you do so again tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Paul had a lot of pressure, and he just kept on going. After he goes through all that, he says, hey, there's something else. Just so you guys know, I have this, this burden, and I prayed for it three times that it depart from me. I've raised the dead and healed people and done all these things, but God said, I'm not going to take that away from you. I had a verse 7 of chapter 12, um, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the, of the uh, revelations. There was given unto me uh, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to uh, buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said, it be my grace is sufficient for thee. And for my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly. Therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities, in persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So he says, not only all the stuff I told you about that was happening to me um, from robbers and perils and shipwrecks and beatings and everything else, jails and everything else. He says, I have the internal pressures of, of all the churches. I got to care for all them. And then each ch church that I have a burden for and want to see it keep going and it's got problems. And then I've got this fleshly thing in my health that's, that's hitting me, an infirmity in the flesh. I believe it was physical, whatever it was. And uh, it, you, Satan just uses it to pound me, pound me, pound me. And, uh, and ask God to take it, uh, take it away. And God said, I'm not going to take it away, but I'm going to give you grace. So that is added to all these things. He has a physical health problem. Most of us face pressure in this life. Now, we're a, we're a high-pressure society, okay? E even America is a high-pressure society. We're in a high-pressure part of America uh, with uh, a lot of industry and, and technology and busyness and, and money and, and, and life and a lot of things moving. There are slow parts of America where it's slower paced, where there's not as much pressure, where you inherited your house from your great grandparents, where, you know, you know where you're going to work with your grandpa. And, you know, life is rural and simpler, you know, more simple. And, and, and maybe you work at a farm and stuff and you kind of, everything's a little different, but there's still pressure. There's always pressure. And we live in a very hard, hard part where we have a lot of pressure here in our world. Jesus said this, uh, in this world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Job 14.1, man that is born of woman is, uh, is a few days and full of troubles. Pressure, troubles. Um, and, and, and the devil's good at making you think you have troubles, therefore God is mad at you. And God, either one, you just can't do anything right because God just mad at you. Or two, um, you know, God just doesn't care. And, and either way, you kind of feel all of a sudden a spiritual pressure. Like uh, God is not, you know, is not something's wrong because I'm not being blessed. And I have all these things go, coming at me at once. And I got a lot of pressure. And, uh, and, uh, and, and but we, we, God says, hey. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In this world, you'll have tribulation. Be of good cheer of overcome the world. You're going to have problems. You're going to have pressures. You're going to have battles. You're going to have this stuff come out to you. But sometimes it just continues. <laughs> See, the pressure, of, the pressure of, okay, you know what, for the next month I've got to study for finals. And that's pressure. Okay? But then you know as soon as the final's done. Okay, I can take a breath. But sometimes in life, the final's not done. And just when you think you're getting out of some pressure, more pressure comes and more pressure comes. And it just keeps on going, keeps on going. And it doesn't seem to ease. And, uh, and it, it might not ease in this world. It didn't ease for Paul. I was, uh, we were at camp. And I was minding my own business. We were swimming time. And you have in the swimming pool, you know, you have... Uh, workers and you have teenagers and you have kids and I was minding my own business floating on an inner tube and uh, laying there in the sun uh, like a bum and uh, and sitting there and uh, some teenager you know I was in the deep end some teenager jumped up and grabbed my shoulders and shoved me under the water and uh, and thought it was so funny and I flipped backwards went to the water I didn't get a chance to get my breath no big deal so I just kind of relaxed going to the water 
And, you know, I start coming up. And, uh, and when I start coming up, he shows me back under again. Well, I hadn't got a breath. And, and so I sit away from him and saying, okay, dumb kid, you know, I got to here, I'm going to drown him. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so I start swimming away and I get, and I'm just about to come to the surface away from him. And all of a sudden, some other kid goes and grabs and shows me back under and I still haven't breathed yet. And so I'm, I, 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 I'm getting kind of panicked. I'm going, I cannot, I need some air very badly here. And then uh, I come out of the water for just a sec, and then some kid sees me and just says, it starts splashing the water right in my face so I couldn't breathe, and I get a mouthful of water. And, and then another kid who had dipped me over backwards decided it would be funny to shove me back under. I still haven't breathed, really. He shoves me back under. And then he stands on me. Oh, wow. And so I start fighting him. They don't understand I'm dying, literally. <laughs> And so I fight my way out from this kid, and I swim over to somewhere else, and I'm just about to hit the surface, and somebody, as soon as my head comes out of the water, some other kid comes by, and he's like, he can't get his, and he starts climbing on me because he can't swim very good. And I go back under the water, and I'm, I'm like, I'm going to die. Literally, I can't, nobody understands this. I cannot breathe. And, and I hadn't started with a good breath in the first place. And, and I, and It went from place, I'm just swimming across the pool trying to get the edge to get a breath. And every time I try to come up, for whatever reason, everybody thought it was funny to shove me back under. Um, And so I am underwater here. I try try to come back up again, and I come underneath some kid laying on a little raft, and I can't get out from underneath the raft. And then somebody sees me and shoves me back, and I'm dying. I'm literally dying. And I think, my thought was, I'm going to die, number one. Number two, With all the dumb things and crazy life I've lived, I'm going to die because of some pudgy 10-year-old kid who thinks it's funny to shove me back underwater. And that's, I I mean, I don't mind the snake. I don't mind the gangbanger, the drug addict attacks me. At least something kind of noble in the gospel ministry type thing. I don't mind the lion attacks me or whatever. You know, I'm... Uh, I'm, you know, uh, they, the, the cannibals get me in the middle of the jungle, all that stuff. It's not, it's not bad for the tombstone or whatever, but I'm going to die by some pudgy 10-year-old shoving me back under one too many times. And I thought, I could handle any one, any two, any three of these guys shoving me underwater. I could handle him dunking me under when I didn't get a breath. I'm fine, but it just didn't stop. And finally, I got violent. I started grabbing kids, shoving them, standing on them. And, uh, and I, got the, I got the edge, and I'm gasping for breath. And some kid comes up and grabs me. I'm going to kill you if you, if you touch me. And, uh, and I get my breath. And I mean, it was, it was dangerous. And I thought, it wasn't so bad being dunked or dunked again or dunked again. But when it doesn't end. And that's what life sometimes is like. Like, I can't get a break here. I cannot get out of the pressure. And, 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 and I can't seem to just get it where everything's settled, stabilized. Yeah. Everything's good. Okay. And I've been through a, a full spectrum of experiences in this realm serving the Lord. And there are seasons where I don't get a break. And the pressure stays. And I don't have an option to not continue to be joyful and peaceful, and strong, and do God's will. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. And Paul says, hey, I got this thorn in the flesh also, but I'm going to rejoice in glory in my tribulation. I'm going to, because when I'm weak, the power of Christ is upon me, and, and then I'm strong. So we have to figure out what to do with the pressure that comes in your life. And when this, I'm, I've got to perform in this, and I've got to have this, and this I want settled, and I'm worried about this, and this is coming. And the truth is, a lot of times, and really in general, my life has been pressure since I've been saved. Uh, and there has been periods where it wasn't high pressure, where I wasn't gasping, okay? But I wasn't out of the pool either, usually. And, 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 and I've had to learn a little bit. And, and my title of my message is Dealing with Pressure. I'm going to give you some practical things here and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and give you some things that the Bible teaches us about pressure in life. Maybe it'll help you so you can deal with it better. Um, and, uh, and, and number one, um, so what shall we do? Number one, Accept God's ordered pressure and settle yourself. 
There is some pressure in life that God has put into your life. You didn't choose it. You didn't earn it. It's just been given to you. Maybe sometimes you, you have a child and your child has special needs. Sometimes your job requires all of a sudden there's a bunch of employees didn't show up or you get promoted to the boss. Or the, it, it can happen a lot of ways where you didn't choose this pressure. You didn't, you didn't ask for it. All of a sudden you're given a ministry and, you, and, and, you, and, and the ministry is very important. You do it right and you have to do that thing. Whatever it is, it's something that God put in your plate. And we see here, Paul says, hey, this is, this is what I was given. And uh, this is what I, what, I, what I have. We see this in, in chapter 12 and verse 8 through 10. He says, hey, there was a thorn given to me. I asked the Lord to make it depart. And God said, I'm not going to make it depart. This has been given by me. It's going to help you. And those things, you must accept the pressure and settle yourself in the pressure. That's what Paul did. Most gladly, therefore right after um, verse 9. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is good for me. This is going to be a blessing. Therefore, I take pleasure in these things. For when I am weak, then am I strong. God has put this on my plate, so I'm going to eat this because this is what God put in my plate. Let me take you to Luke 21. The phrasing here is, is, it's during the tribulation, but the phrasing here is a practical thing for Christians to be able to do in their mind. And I think it'll help you. I had to do this over the last, let's see, what are we in, October? I had to do this starting in August. And I've been doing this since August, okay? Because I just got dumped on with pressure um, since August. And that's not a complaint at all. It's, it's fine. Uh, uh, it's, it's all treasures in heaven. And, uh, and another way to show the Lord you love him. Um, Luke 21 and you're going to be going through it, the tribulation, and uh, the, the, the believers there, you better prepare yourself, the Jewish believers and the other ones who get saved in the tribulation, when the Antichrist comes after you and all those things, you better make some decisions in your heart and in your mind. Uh, let's go down and let's, uh, let's start at, say, verse 10. Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be uh, in diverse places, and famines, and pestilence, and uh, fearful sights and great signs shall, um, uh, shall there be from heaven. But before all these things, they shall lay their hands upon you and persecute you, uh, delivering you unto um, the synagogues and unto prisons, being brought uh, before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you uh, for a testimony. So look, you're gonna, there's going to be natural disasters everywhere, incredible persecution, people turning you in, and then you're going to go on trial and come before leaders and kings, and it's going to be, you're going to be, for your testimony, facing serious legal consequences. Verse 14, settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. I'm going to give you the answer. Verse 15. For I will give your mouth, uh, give to your mouth, uh, you a mouth of wisdom, uh, which uh, your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay uh, nor resist. And ye shall be betray, uh, betrayed both uh, by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you, they should be caused to put to death. Now notice the pressure there. It's going to come to these believers. Be ready for it, uh, tribulation saints. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Pressure, natural disasters, uh, uh, prison and persecution, direct family turning against you and attacking you, hated by all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. In verse 19, in your patience possess ye your souls. Possess your souls means be under control of your soul and mind and know ahead of time what you're going to do and decide I am in control and this is what I'm going to do in this situation. I am going to continue to serve God. I'm going to accept that my family hates my guts. I'm going to accept that I get turned in by my own brother. I'm going to, turn, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to accept this thing and I'm possessing my soul. I am just like a demon possesses a person. I'm going to possess my soul and I'm going to be in charge of it. Yeah. I'm settling things. And so, uh, be of a sober mind is all over the Bible. 
Be sober, be, be uh, vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, for as Peter tells us. So, um, I, I, we, 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 we had to make a decision on, uh, on Congo, and so um, I, I, I made a decision. I finally bought the tickets. It, it just it looked like it was going to be a busy time, but I felt like God wanted us to go, and he did want us to go. And so I bought the tickets, and everything's going good, and then all of a sudden, I, I done my research, I thought I was all ready, and, and then I found out I needed this visa, okay, um, that I didn't know about and that the, the, the company site didn't have on there. And, and so um, I said, oh, man, this is going to be a little bit tight, but we can get it done. And so I went and I, I hired a visa company. I said, hey, can you get me this visa? And so I paid them to do that, and they said, you, this, you, don't, you have, to have an invitation letter. I said, I have an invitation letter. I sent it to you. They said, that doesn't have the right signatures. you got to have it from all the government officials and from this department, this department, this department. And I said, oh, no, the third world, this department, this department, this department. It's bad enough in America to go in government bureaucracies. Try the Congo. And, uh, and so I said, oh, brother. So I messaged him back, and he says, no, this is the way that it's supposed to be done. And I said, well, they're saying no. And, uh, and so um, we, 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 I mean, now I'll sit around a time constraint. So now he finds out, okay, we, you might have to do this. And long story short, he starts trying to get it through the government and get it back to me in time. But now I'm facing three weeks. I've got to go. I've got to set my passports already not with me. Um, I've had to send that into the visa company and, and now we've got to get this invitation and he's going through all the processes and I've got to get this visa back in time to go on the trip. And then afterward, I've got a million other things and there's absolutely nothing I can do. <laughs> Has nothing. And so I just said, all right, you know what? I think God wants me to go on this trip. You know what? We'll just make it happen. I could show you the strings of emails and messages to Africa saying, hey, you know what? I think God wants me to go. It's going to work out. I'm not going to worry about it. He says, Pastor, we have everything lined up, da, 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 da. And, 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 and we've got schedules and this and that. And I said, look, we can't do anything about it. It's in God's hand. Just pray about it. I believe God wanted me to go. We prayed about this. I'm trusting the Lord. I'm not going to worry about it. That's possessing your soul. We've had the church pray about it. We can do that. But I just said, Whatever happens, happens. It's in God's hands. I am not going to get make this pressure make me or or any of those things. I got too many things to do. I got too many important things to do. And so I'm settling my heart. Well, all of a sudden, the bombs started landing time-wise. And I said, oh, brother, this is going to be a horrible time to go to this trip. We got a lot going on here. And we got a lot of things that have to be done afterward. I know I'm going to lose a lot of time going to the Congo. And this is, this is going on. And I got all of a sudden this came in from the Philippines. And this came in here. And this problem came in here. And everything started coming. And before the trip, I just had a z And I was just running. I said, I got so many things to do. And, and running is not, running and being busy and being efficient is not a panic. It's not a bad thing. Um, I just got busy and started working on things and working on things. Working on things and I, until the flight left. And I sat down in the flight and says, all right, I didn't get some things done. But we're going, to, we're going to Congo now. All of a sudden, I switched and I said, okay, now I'm in Congo mode. There's nothing else going on. We're going to go reach Congo. What about all the things you had back here? I, I, did, I possessed my soul. I didn't decide to worry about them. I, I couldn't do anything about them. And off we went. Guess what? When I was in Congo, we had problems back here. My wife only contacts me if there's something serious and I'm in a mission ship because she knows I'm older focused. And we had some problems. What did you do? I said, Lord, it's what's going on. You just you got to deal with this stuff. I can only do so much with it. And I give this stuff to you. Here's the best thing I'm going to do. And honey, here's what I'm going to give you, tell you what to do. There's some things, you know, do this. If this doesn't work out, I just trust your judgment because you know what I do. And, and talk to, and I think, I think Andrew was involved in the situation where they're helping us with it and stuff. And I just said, you know what? I can't do anything about it. And you know what? It's, it's God's church. Uh, God will have to take care of it. But it was a, it was a pretty serious situation. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't do anything about it. I got back, and bombs started flying. Talk about bombs flying. About two weeks ago is when it really started coming here. Amen. I mean, pressures, problems. The schedule is busy. 
everything, printing, uh, big day schedules, finances, where everything, some problems we had to deal with overseas and just this and that. And then, and then some people problems came in this last week and, and major people problems and time things. And, but I'd already settled in my heart. Hey, this is God's deal. I'm in God's hands. Lord, take care of these things. And, and, and then this last week was, there's a numbing period you get to after a while. And all of a sudden, people come to me with this thing, and I'm, and, 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 and there was, there was, the, the devil tried everything. <laughs> he tried the pressure, he tried the problems, he tried the heartache, he tried the criticism, he tried uh, uh, every single thing. And by that time, I was just like, you know, hey, I've been punched 50 times, what's another punch? I mean, you know, whatever. I, and I just had, and I just, I've learned over the years that, hey, this is something God's put on my plate. I'm going to be of good cheer. Amen. I'm not going to be nasty to the people I know. I'm not going to get frustrated. I'm not going to come up here and preach a sermon on something. I'm going to preach as I always preach. I'm going to do what I always do. I'm going to love people, and I'm going to spend time and help people and fix problems and do all that stuff. I'm going to possess my soul and do that as he said. I think verse 14, settle in your hearts. Verse 19, possess your souls. I was talking to a guy, this is, I don't know, maybe uh, 26, 27 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. I was in Chicago, and I was talking to an old guy. He was a World War II veteran. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of flow through this to the end of the sermon. Um, he was telling me that he was in World War II, and I think he said he was in a troop ship in World War II. And he told me, he said, it, we, got, we got hit by a typhoon in the Pacific. And he said it was massive and huge. And he said, our, our captain saved all of our lives. He says, our, our, our ship was so susceptible to sinking. We got sep separated from everything else, and a lot of ships sunk in this thing. And he says, we were in that thing for, I think he said, three days. And he said, he just he named his captain's name, and he said, he saved our lives. He said, everybody else tried to fight this hurricane. And he, and he, I don't know, all nautical stuff. He just basically said, he was in the Navy, and he said, basically, he said, our captain just, just let the wind blow us. And, and we just sat there in that storm being pushed across the Pacific for three days and just, just not fighting it. And he handled it so well, and he just, he, just, he just turned the boat the right direction with the wind, where the wind would blow him. The, you know, and he wasn't, he, wasn't getting, he, wasn't, he wasn't running into the waves. He wasn't... It's just where he was, and he knew what to do in that situation. And he explained to me all the things. I don't remember all the things he said and how he said. I think when God has put hurricanes in your life, you just keep serving God and do what you're supposed to do. You don't panic. You possess your soul. You say, hey, God's put me here. This is what God wants me to do. I don't change a sermon this morning's sermon of faithfulness was there a while back. I've got, I've got a list of sermons that I'm behind, and we're, we're as God leads, and we're not going to go and and make rash decisions. We're not going to flip out. It's just pressure. That's it. So if you if you're under financial pressure, what are you going to do? <gasps> Look, you can't even pay any bills today, right? Okay, then just enjoy the day and thank God. Can't do anything about it. Don't fight the hurricane. God's put it in your life. Just possess your soul. Decide what you're going to do. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to pray about this. I'm going to go work this extra thing I can do or whatever you're going to do. But do it on purpose, not because pressure is, is doing this to, to you. Uh, you can make a decision to be okay under pressure. That, let me go to John 14. These are very familiar verses. But Jesus is telling them, hey guys, I'm going away, but you need to be good. Let not your heart be troubled, John 14, 1. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also, and whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Jesus says, hey guys, I, you're, I'm leaving you, but... You're going to be fine. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Let not your heart be troubled. 
giving into pressure and panicking and being angry and being frustrated and being uh, all that stuff is it's a choice. Now, if you're weak, if you've never learned to discipline your mind, then you almost don't have a choice because you're just going to be drugged there because you can't control things. But Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. That's a decision. That's a decision. You choose not to do that. You're going to go through a trial ordered by God sometimes, and it's for your good, and the pressure of that trial will change you and be good for you. Let's go to James chapter 1. I've reacted wrong to pressure many times. I can get stressed out with the best of them. But I've learned through the years that my stress doesn't help anything. It hurts things. James chapter 1, sometimes God's put it on your plate. Verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trial of your faith worketh patience. But let, her patient, let patience have her perfect work. You need perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And, uh, and God's going to purify you through, through the trial. I mean, so working, working, working endlessly. Uh, and thank God, God sent some people to help and, and with the things. There were so many things, because he wanted to get the building in good shape, and wanted to, uh, we had a lot of things to hang and paint and fix and everything else. And so last night I was working, and I finally said, I have got to get to prayer and Bible study, and there's still things not done. And I remembered, and I don't know what time it was. It was late. And all of a sudden I remembered, oh, goodness, the sink in the kitchen's clogged. Ugh. I said, you know what, Lord, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to quit working. There's still things to do, but I'm not going to worry about it. I need to get the spiritual side ready. If the building's a little messy or something's broken, it's broken, uh, and, 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 and there's always something to do, but you trust God that God put that in your plate, and God has put things in your life, and the things that God's put there, you just settle yourself and accept that God might be doing something, and you count it all joy when you're put in those situations. Number two, there is good pressure, and that pressure is called motivation. Now, this pressure you can put on yourself, and that's okay. Sometimes that pressure God puts on you to motivate you. And that pressure is not bad. Good pressure is motivation, and that's a good thing. Okay? Doctor tells you if you don't lose 30 pounds, you're going to have a heart attack. And you get motivated to lose weight, and you're under pressure. Okay, that's good. It's helping you do a good thing. And, and, and you choose to take some pressure on you and say, I'm going to do this. Now, however you do that, uh, to whatever motivates you, you might be a, a person who sets goals, and that's fine. I'm not that. I'm, I'm not a goal setter. Um, but but you might, it might go that you just uh, schedule things, and that's, that's more what I do. It might be you get accountability or something, but, but pressure from motivation. Let me show you this in the Bible, some people who had uh, 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 motivation. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Paul had pressure for souls on him. He chose to have that, and it's something God put in his heart, and so he kept himself under pressure to reach the world. I do that. I want that burden. I want the burden for the Great Commission to reach the world, and I want pressure on myself. It pushes me to serve God. It doesn't pressure me. I, I don't let it pressure me in the wrong way to think that I have to do everything because it's God's work, but it pressures me to work hard, to plan, to, to, to help pastors, to help ministry, to start churches and do all that stuff because otherwise I could, live a very, I could live a very comfortable life just pastoring this church. But I have to stay motivated for the Great Commission. Y'all got, y'all kind of, you quit nodding, quit understanding motivation is good when you use it to do a good thing. I am motivated to get good grades, okay? That's a good thing, okay? And you put pressure on yourself. I want straight A's, okay? If that helps you, that's good. Just make sure you understand that you're not inflicting yourself, you're motivating yourself. And it's things you can control, and it's things that God wants you to do. Um, Romans chapter 1, look at Paul says, look at his motivation. So as, verse 15, sorry, as much as in me is, 
I am ready to preach the gospel to them, which be in Rome also. You know, it's interesting. He says in verse 14, I'm a debtor, both the Greeks and the barbarians, both the wise and wise. He says, I'm in debt to preach the gospel to these people. As much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to them that are in Rome, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He is motivated to preach the gospel. It's because of a burden of Romans 10, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, is that they might be saved. He's motivated with a burden, and he's motivated to serve God. And I don't know how to serve God without a, without motivation we're running through a generation now people without motivation it, to get a job to to pay their bills to take care of their family to get up in the morning and, and, and they're not motivated and look i think you have to have motivation to be a functional human i think in the spiritual realm, you better get some motivation because the devil's going to give you motivation to not serve god and that pressure is okay. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, the love of Christ constraineth us. The word constrains almost means like, like, like puts you, like handcuffs you. It, 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 it means to bind something, to compress. And, uh, and so the love of Christ constrains us. We're motivated by it to do what God wants, to reach the world, to help people. Watch, it, watch Jesus. Watch how he's, he has pressure on himself. Because he's motivated for a good thing. Oh, Romans in chapter 9 and verse, um, verse uh, 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while, uh, while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Jesus says, look... I am putting some pressure on myself. I need to do what God's given me to do. And there's a time where there's a time constraint here. And that's motivating me. I think sometimes when you're possessing your soul and you say, I need to put pressure on myself to get this done, to, to do this thing I need to do. Sometimes you need to put a time constraint on yourself. I need to get this. I'm going to finish my Bible by January. I'm going to uh, uh, start witnessing this week. I'm going to begin praying for 15 minutes a day. Whatever it is, you start motivating yourself. And Jesus says, I've got to work the work. He's motivated. That's pressure. He's put it on himself. He says, look, I, got, I have to go, guys, because the time comes when no man can work. Right now, everybody's seeing Jesus coming. We're all seeing that. And it should motivate us to work harder and be, be more motivated for God. That is what it should be doing for us. It's not a false pressure. It's a decided pressure. It's a motivation to do more for God. Okay? Hell might motivate you. There's a lot of things that might motivate you, but you, you, that pressure on yourself is okay. Because there's good pressure and there's bad pressure. Good pressure is what we would call motiva uh, motivated. Number three. There is bad pressure. Oh, man, this is where we got a problem. Matthew 6. There is bad pressure we put on ourselves. I'm going to just start at verse 34. I'll give you a couple Bible stories and, and, uh, and, and, and try to just get this to us. Matthew 6, 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow should take thought of itself. Sufficient of the day is the evil thereof. There is a bad pressure of worrying. Or is a bad pressure where you're freaked out, where you don't think God's in control, where, you, where, you, where you're panicky, and God's not giving us a spirit of fear. And that bad pressure is horrible for you. It's, it's a big worry about the future that you don't have answers for. But God doesn't promise to give you answers for tomorrow. He only promises for today. And many people put bad pressure on themselves, and bad pressure makes you respond very badly. You get panicky, you get angry, you lose your faith, you get mad at God, you, you, you start uh, being mad at everybody who doesn't help you enough, and, and, and everybody doesn't understand how, and, and you, you, you get very angry, and you wonder why this hasn't worked out, and you get mad at your boss for not paying you enough, and the rent for how much it is, and this, and you're mad about everything, and that's not the spirit God wants, nor is the spirit of fear that is often caused by bad pressure you put on yourself, because God will only work out your day. Give us this day our daily bread. Take no thought of the morrow. Don't even think about tomorrow. Is today is your need met? And so let me tell you, if you want to possess your soul, one of the biggest things you'll ever do is stop and say, hey, 
I don't know what's going to happen at the end of the month. It's a mess. But you know what? I have food today. Today, I have a roof over my head. I don't know what I'm gonna, how I'm going to buy gas at the end of the month, but today I have gas. You know, everybody I talk to can always handle today. God gave you grace for today, but the Bible says take no thought of the morrow. The mar- tomorrow has enough problems itself, but you borrow tomorrow's problems, pull them into today, and say it's not worked out. No, because God doesn't, doesn't fix tomorrow's problems because it's never tomorrow. He takes care of today. That's why he told Israel, hey, go out and collect enough manna for today. No, I'm going to stack up a bunch. God said, I'm teaching you. If you're trusting the flesh in the world, you've got to have everything worked out for the next month, two months, any retirement and everything else. But if you trust me, you can just relax and thank God for today. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice. I will be glad and rejoice in it. You mean I'm just rejoicing in this day? Yeah. That's what you're supposed to do. But many people bring that pressure of tomorrow, next week, next year, whatever, whatever's going to happen, and they bring it in today, and they get so overwhelmed with bad pressure of tomorrow, with lack of faith pressure they put upon themselves, instead of enjoying the day God gave them, and God's saying, hey, I gave you a great day today. Look at the great food you have. Look how, look at what you have, and you're just sitting there worrying about tomorrow. You can't even enjoy today. Stop. It's that terrible pressure you have on yourself. Evil surmisings make you think about what problems might come. And if this happens, then I'm going to get so mad at this person because they did this and they put me in this position. And if my mama and my brother and my pastor and my friend, if they would have done this to me, and this might happen. And you write a whole story that hasn't happened yet. And you start living and based on emotions and treating people based on what may never happen. That's bad pressure. This happens, we see, if you go back in the chapter a little bit, verse 24 goes back, um, and, and it talks about who you serve. Verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either hate the one and, and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, connected statement, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, or for yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? 25 is connected to 24. You're thinking about your provision, and therefore you're serving money, and money is your master. So, I don't work through church. I go so in on Saturday. But couldn't you work a bunch of them? Seek ye first, is verse 33, the kingdom of God. And many times I've, and we talk about the start of the church, how short of money we were. And what are you going to do this month? How are you going to pay your bills? What are you going to do? I have no idea. So today, I got scheduled. I'm going to sleep when I get back from work. I get back to work about 7 in the morning. I'm going to spend some time with the family, and I'm going to go in and sleep until I wake up. I'll go up. Then I'm going to go up soul in about 2 o'clock and go soul in until about 6, come back, spend time with the family, and then I will um, get, I will uh, go and get ready for work, and then I'll hit go to work and leave for work about 9 o'clock at night, go pray before I go to work, do my Bible time, and then I'll go to work, and then I'll do the same thing tomorrow. And that's my schedule. But how are you going to pay your bills? I don't know. Don't you worry about that? Okay, worry doesn't put money in my wallet. Worry doesn't help anything. It's bad pressure. If, 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 if I was lazy and not doing anything, then I would say, yeah, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. I should worry about my provision, and that motivates me to work. But I've n- that's not my problem. It's not working enough. And so I just said, Lord, you see my bills. You know how much I am not living exorbitant at all. I'm trusting you. My finances are yours, Lord. I'm, I'm not going to worry about them. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to take no thought of what you shall eat or what you shall drink, what you put on. You told me not even think about it, not worry about it at all. That's bad pressure. I get enough pressure on me. And I'm not going to add pressure because I'm seeking your kingdom first. It's your job to provide for me. Then I kick back and trust the Lord when I'm 
in patience possessing my soul, when I'm settling in my heart. Verse 26, what happens? Behold the fowls of the air. They don't worry about it. They don't, they're not wor- Are the birds worried? No. Are the lilies worried? No, but God clothes the lilies beautifully. The birds all eat, don't they? God cares about you more than the birds. Relax. Relax. He commands us. Don't worry about this stuff. Verse 28. Why take ye thought for raiment? God, God says, hey, Solomon has, has done this. Verse 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. That's an unsaved person's pressure. For your heavenly Father knoweth ye have need of these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Don't worry about it. And take no thought of the morrow. I'm going to take care of you tomorrow. I got you today. Rejoice in this day. I provided for you. I'll take care of tomorrow. Quit being pressured by the things of life and finances. Because you will begin to serve them, and they'll become your master, is what the chapter says. So don't be pressured by bad pressures. What's another bad pressure? People pressure. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare. The fear of man brings a snare. The three Hebrew children, Daniel, they didn't worry about, they didn't let people dictate their life and force them with their pressure and with the fear mongering, all those things. They don't have to do that. And it's a liberating thing. Man, if you knew the pressure pastors feel by people in the church demanding things of them and telling them what to preach and what not to preach and and saying they're going to withhold their tithe. (laughs) And the pressure put on by man. And it's real. I thank God I don't feel that pressure at all. I, I worry about pleasing God. God can provide my needs. I don't need a rich, a rich person to provide my needs. I got God. I'm going to preach in that guy's sin just like I'm preaching everybody else's sin. If you don't like it, the fear of man is a bad pressure. The fear of man's a bad pressure. And people intimidate you and say, you know, I'll never talk to you again if you don't do this for me. Give me this money. Okay. The, you know what? That is a bad person. They're not your friend or they wouldn't say, I would never talk to you again if you don't give me something. You need to let them go. And not, I never let anybody manipulate me. I don't let them do it with the church. I don't let, uh, somebody says, you know, if you, if you love Jesus, you would help me and give me some cash. And, and maybe the other church say, oh, I'm sorry, I do love Jesus. Here you go. Hmm. I, I'm not going to be manipulated by bad pressure, guilt pressure by humans who don't have their act together. Got a scripture for me and say, hey, you're, you know, you're doing something wrong. Okay, fine. But, but the fear of man and manipulation, and, and, and I don't even know why man, people try to manipulate me. It's, it's what a waste of time. I just, I just, it's just not my deal. I, I'm just not going to fall down and curl in a ball because you say I don't like you. Okay, just not me. I, I, have, I have the person I need to like me. I have God. I got bonuses. I got my wife and kids. And, and, and if I have that, I'm good. And then I got even more bonuses. I got church people who half of them like me some Sundays. And, uh, and, and, but that good pressure is not people manipulating you. Daniel was not manipulated. David was not manipulated. They threatened uh, the apostles. And the apostles said, hey, I'm not going to quit preaching Jesus. They got pressure put on them. They said, it's not going to change anything. Now, those are just some things about pressure. <laughs> Goodness. You good if I keep on going for a little bit? Because I'm going to teach you a little bit of methods. Okay? You good? We're late. Ways to joyfully live under pressure. So let's say you're going to be under pressure for a long time. You've just, whatever order has been ordered in your life is going to be under pressure. I probably will be. I'm, I, I'm always, I've always got so many ministries going on and so many things. I, I'm, I'm so busy. And I, and, and I like my life. My life's a ball. But, but. Um, but understand, I, I, I'm probably going to be under pressure the rest of my life because I'm, I'm trying to reach the whole world, and I, I'm just urgent about that. And, and so I'm probably going to be. And so 
I've got to learn to live under it. Now, if the pressure doesn't come, hey, I'm, you know, I'm really doing good. But you got to learn to live under pressure. Okay, how to live under, I'm just going to give you some, some methods and some ways to joyfully live under pressure. And I'm going to just give you some verses. I'll try to go quick through these. Number one, don't worry about provision, Matthew 6, 31. Provision is God's job if you're serving him. If you're not serving God, then it's your job. Okay, don't worry about provision. Number two, don't worry about the future, Matthew 6, 34. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The way to live under pressure that's helped me so much, God did me a favor. I've told the story, and I'll massively abbreviate it. But the, uh, one circumstance, one event taught me how to live under pressure, and I have no idea how I'm going to make it, what's going to happen. It, when, when the church, when nobody was coming, and it looked like nobody ever come, that, that was a lot of pressure when I thought, even when a visitor comes, nobody else is here, and it's a horrible service. We don't have any music, and the singing's terrible, and we're in this dumpy building, and none of the visitors are looking around going, sometimes, a lot of times, a visitor is the only person who came. Sometimes if they came, be one other person. And, and I'm t- unfortunately, when I started the church, the only people who were coming were pack highway people who didn't know where they were half the time. And so the visitor would look over the person next to them and they're drooling and, you know, whatever they're doing and crazy. And, and that was the visitors going, am I safe at this church? And it's this pastor up there and it's this guy here. And that's what, and I thought, but I had to keep on going and keep on preaching and keep on doing God's work under that pressure every month thousands of dollars in going into debt, all those, a, a big family, five, three, probably three, four, five kids at the time, all that stuff. I had to learn to live joyfully. God prepared me for that. Back when I was working my job at a trucking company, my job was to put the trailers away. And, uh, and the trailers, I just hooked up to them with this, what we call the jockey horse. I'd take them, I'd boom, park them out in the parking lot. Well, we had, there was a union strike. And when the union struck, all the freight went over to uh, our country company, which was non-union. And so we had way too much freight, way too many trucks. And the truck drivers were working a million hours, so they got very lazy and they wouldn't do their job. And my job at the entrance was to put the trailers away and nobody was doing their job. The other people were supposed to back me up. They wouldn't do it. The other people doing my job. Uh, they were, we had different, we we're all parking trailers and doing trailers, but their job was to back up the dock, but that wasn't a very busy job. My job was to put them away, which was crazy. The truck drivers wouldn't unhook their, tra- their trailers from each other. There are two pups hooked together and a dolly in between. They're supposed to unhook all those. It takes a little while to take the air out and to, and to pull the cotter pin and pull it apart and, and put the dolly away. They're supposed to do that. Trucking, truckers wouldn't do that. Um, and the people wouldn't help me do it. And there's just too many trailers. And I was sprinting. I was literally running as fast as I could, doing everything I could, trying to put this stuff away. And I started having heart problems. And I, I, asked, I was furious to the other people who wouldn't help me, who did the job, who were just sitting over there talking while I was doing this like crazy. And, and, and the truck drivers who wouldn't do their job. And then they would get backed out all the way out of the terminal, all the way onto the road. And I'd be looking back there. And, and I went and I had to do a bunch of heart tests because I was having problems breathing and heart problems. And <clears throat> I was 28, maybe 27. I must have been 27 or 26. And, uh, and they went through all these massive tests and the cardiologist came back and he said, your heart is fantastic. He just came with a big file. He just dropped it into the table there. And he says, your heart is strong as a horse. He says, but you have all the signs of heart problems. He says, are you under a lot of stress? I said, oh, my soul. I said, I, I run as fast as I can. I'm so, you know, and I started telling him, he says, you're going to die by the time you're 40. And the Holy Spirit right there said, I'm teaching you one of the most important lessons in your life. Your job is to put the trailer away. And you're going to go and you're going to put one trailer away at a time and not do anything else. I said, okay. Went back to work that night. Back out the trailer. Hooked up the trailer. Put the airline on. Lifted the trailer, off I went, went and put the trailer away. Went back, back up the next trailer, went underneath it, hooked the airline on, put the next trailer away. I was, I'm like, how far back? God said, don't look back. Don't see if you're backed up in the road. Don't look and see what the other jockeys are doing and if they're helping you. Your job is to be joyful and trust me and rejoice in me, sing some songs and put a trailer away. And so I'd back up, put a trailer away. I didn't look at how many trailers are back there. I didn't see the truck driver was doing his job. I didn't see what other people were doing. 
I just backed up and put a trailer away. Put the next trailer away. All of a sudden, I learned to relax and say, all I can do is put one trailer away at a time. <laughs> That's all I can do. And I'm just going to put the trailer away. I'm not going to worry about if this guy parks wrong. I'm not going to worry about what the other people are doing. I can't control them. I can't control the, I can't control the truck drivers. I can't control what happens in traffic. I'm just going to rejoice in the Lord and do my job well. And somehow in that weird process, God taught me to relax under pressure. And when that happened, I learned to just not worry about tomorrow. Today's good. <laughs> Today's good. It taught me just to do what I'm supposed to do and not worry about everybody else. What if everybody in the church won't help you? What if they? I'll do my job. I got a person who's hurting over here. I'm going to go help them. I have this person I need to witness to. I got to prepare a sermon. That's, that's, I got to do what I'm supposed to do. And I'm going to trust God with, if we need a labor, God will send them. If we need a building, God will give us a building. I don't need a building today. What are we going to do, Pastor, when you grow out of this building? When the lease is up? I don't know. You can worry about it for me. I don't know. I got enough to worry about if I want to worry. Just... Just go and don't worry about the future. Don't worry about the future. Next, don't worry. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing. And uh, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Be careful for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That's a command of God. It says, Take no thought. Sometimes that'll be translated in Matthew 6, it'll be translated, Don't worry. God's got it under control. You're in the hand of God. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all that ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. Next, pray instead of worrying. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Let your, just go and thank God for today and say, Lord, you know what? I, 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 I want to worry about this, this thing in my future relationship, and I don't know what to do about it, Lord. But, Lord, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just telling you right now, I don't know what to do about it. I would like this to happen. I'm asking for this. Thy will be done. And leave it there. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Pray about it. Don't worry about it. Come boldly to the throne of grace that you may time, uh, find uh, grace to help in time of need. God says, hey, come and pray, Hebrews 4.16, and I will help you in your time of need. But don't worry about it. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry about it. Just pray about it Amen. with thanksgiving. Next, count your blessings. Philippians 4, um, uh, uh, 6, be careful for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Count your blessings. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are, uh, are, are true, whatsoever things are, um, uh, 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 are just, whatsoever things are, uh, goodness, I have this verse memorized, and all of a sudden I, I, I blurred it all together. Whatsoever things are honest, uh, whatsoever things are just, uh, whatsoever things are pure, and whatsoever things are lovely, what, uh, if there be any, uh, whatsoever things are good reported, there be any virtue, there be any praise, think on these things. And so he says, hey, Think on the blessings. Make your prayers with thanksgiving. Count your blessings. You have food today. You have a roof over your head today. You have water today. Amen. Your car runs today. But it's not going to run. That. Stop. <laughs> I understand if you can do something about it, then do something about it. But if you can't do anything about it, just thank God and count your blessings. You could be in the, in, in the emergency room with your kid in the ICU. There's a lot of things could be worse than what you're facing, but the devil will magnify every problem to the level of miserable. Yeah. Every problem. And you could, and, and look, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 I could tell third world stories all day, but it's pretty easy for me to count my blessings. So I had to go on a mission ship you possibly can with me. Because you come back and say, goodness, what was I so worried about? What was I freaking out about? You just learn to live daily. Next, keep your mind on the Lord. Isaiah 26, 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. 
Keep your mind on the Lord and his power and his ability. Another verse, Psalm 61 and verse 2. Psalm 61 and verse 2. And it says this, From the end of the earth shall I cry unto thee, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Sometimes things are above you and you can't figure out the problem. Next, be patient and wait in the Lord. Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is a great chapter for this. We can use a lot of passages on waiting in the Lord. Be patient. Trust God. Can I say as we look at our 25th anniversary... Can I just give a testimony that I waited on God? My wife waited on God. My wife will tell you, she, she kind of thought, you know what? I don't know if this guy knows what he's doing, but it's his church. But we waited on God. And we're so blessed. We have such a unified church. We have so few problems in our church, and we can do so many things. We, but God has given us the great blessings, but we had to wait till it was his time. And that time up for the first few years was developing me so I could be a much better pastor and help a lot more pastors. Psalm 27, and uh, this will we'll, we'll probably uh, finish up here. Psalm, you, can, you can write down Lamentations 3, 25, and 26. Let the Lord uh, just wait on him, and, and he'll, he'll be fine. Psalm 27, though. Verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Uh, verse uh, uh, 5, for the tri time of trouble he will hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall hide me. Uh, you know what? I am not in the right passage. Let me go to Psalm 127 and see if that's what I'm thinking of here. Oh, those are good verses there, almost on the subject. And uh, it, is, it is not that. And uh, yeah, let, me, let me double check this, see if I can find what I have written down here. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's Psalm 27. Then verse 14, wait in the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It says, you know, just wait. God will strengthen your heart. Wait on God in his time. Just be patient. Everything will work out, and you trust in God. So pressure is going to come. And sometimes it doesn't stop. And sometimes you think, okay, now I'm going to get a day off. And all of a sudden, guess what? There goes your day off. Some emergency happens. So wait. Trust. Pray about it. And be content and be joyful. Rejoice in the Lord always. And trust God with today. Because God can take care of you. And God can provide for you. And God can make everything you need to work out. And, uh, and, and, and he can do all the things you need. You just got to be patient. And God will help you through it. There's pressure. There's going to be pressure. And, uh, and all of us sometimes fail in that pressure thing. But today's good.